Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, Sunday, 16th July. And uh, from today onwards, for the next four Sundays, we are uh, dedicating ourselves to uh, understand and also promote interfaith harmony. And I will say a little bit, just about five minutes uh, to explain why we are doing it. And then uh, we will invite uh, Soraya to do her presentation. And after that, we can engage in a discussion. So if you look at uh, uh, interfaith harmony, I mean, that's a very important thing for Sri Lanka at the moment. I'll tell you the reasons. So about three, four weeks ago, uh, Susanta Heva, who's written about this in the papers, actually uh, gave us a talk and we had a very good discussion. And we learned a few things. What did we learn? We learned that religions are not dangerous and religions are not anti-human. Religions should promote harmony. And then he thought, this is just absurd talking about interfaith harmony because such a thing should not arise uh, if we are following our religions properly. So that was the uh, idea that he had, which is probably true. But... Look at this situation in around the, in Sri Lanka as well as just in the neighboring countries. That was uh, Easter Sunday attack where there was a conflict or whatever, politically motivated, whatever. You had a severe bomb blast which killed over 270 people. This is India where the Hindus are protesting against Muslims. This is Bangladesh, Hindus get killed. This is Sri Lanka. And uh, this is this one is Sri Lanka. This is, a, I don't know, a different country. But again, Buddhist monks engage in violence. And why do religions and people who are following religions engage in violence? This is the major issue we have. And it's between the followers. That's the next thing. Oh, they're not different people. They're following Hindu. And then why are they fighting? So this is the problem. So this is today. Our Sunday Times, fifth column, says Buddhism in Par Paradise Island brings out uh, this kind of uh, things that's happening in the country at the moment in Sri Lanka to the attention of the Nayaka Hamdros. So this is a publication where people are taking interest in trying to resolve this issue. So we all have, have our own religious uh, spiritual leaders, they ha all have original core teachings. So then these core teachings started to get followed by more and more people, and then it becomes a religion. So, so for example, when uh, Lord Buddha was born, there was no Buddhism. So he, there were other faiths, and then his vision and uh, explanations were taken up by people, and that's how a religion is born. But over the years, things happen to these core teachings because it get then covered by various other things that people invent in relation to the religion, like rules and regulations, rituals and rifts and cults, various other things happen. So... So even the same religion can now split into different forms before, because of this. Some people think they, it has happened for the good. Some people think it may have happened for the bad. So we are in that kind of uh, living today in Sri Lanka. So the practices that are now in Sri Lanka may be very different to what the original spiritual leader, uh, leader has taught or maybe it's spinning around it. So this is what... We want to clarify. And so the Lankans, the religions, at the moment, which I've personally kind of experienced speaking to people, they're fearful of each other. They don't talk about it, but that's the case. Suspicious of each other, blames each other, and claims superiority for power. Now, this is an issue that has happened to our religions. So why leads? We want to promote harmony between the religions simply because without peace, no country can develop. And we are in a really dreadful state in Sri Lanka at the moment because of the economic thing. So economic collapse, and then we really need peace if you want to develop. So 
this is a World Bank graph which shows that how the peace actually promotes higher GDP growth. So, so if you have very good pace, your growth is over three percent. Uh, yeah, so that's how it goes. Now, this is a article that was published uh, in the island about two years ago, which I happened to read and I remembered. It's probably better to refer to this at this particular time, so that we understand a little bit more about what he's talking about. This is written by a, a Muslim author, and he says, need to rescue Muslims from Islamists. And he gives some definitions in this, which I thought I'll write it down separately. So he refers to Muslims as Muslims are ordinary people, just like others, following Islam as their religion, regardless of the interval in which they engage in religious rituals. Their day-to-day -day life is not dominated by religion in total. Then they, he also described Islamists. Islamists is a small dominant group within the Muslim community that uses hegemonic powers to control the community. They believe only Islam should rule the whole world. All Muslims should follow Islam in total and jihad should be declared against the people who do not accept Islam. Sacrificing the lives for the sake of Islam is the greatest honor, etc. Then they also describe jihadists. Jihadists are generally evolved from amongst the Islamists. Jihadists are the people who use violence, terror, and assault weapons to achieve what the Islamists believe and what Islamists ploy to achieve through long-term agendas. So, so jihadists remain to be Islamists until they are prepared to carry out the terror attacks. So, so he describes something like that. So that's one author's viewpoint. So today uh, we are trying to get people, or today uh, we are talking about Islamism. And Islamism is uh, led, this talk is led by Soraya Dean. I'm not going to describe uh, author's details as such in any of these presentations because the person who is talking is speaking as a lay devotee of it, this particular uh, religion. So we will understand from a lay devotee who speaks about this, and then we try to understand whether there's anything in conflict with the others. Probably not. So that's what we want to do so that we don't have to be frightened of each other because we are having different faiths. So the next Sunday, we'll be talking about Christianity, then 30th July, hopefully Hinduism, and 6th August about Buddhism. So I will stop here and I'll ask uh, um, uh, Soraya to share the slides. Okay, while you do that, Chula, I think I can begin. May I? Yeah, I can put the slides on, but you can talk when you want the slides. Just let me know, yeah? Okay. All right, yeah. Okay, okay welcome. So, thank you so much, Chula, and thank you everybody else on the call. Um, I think we live in a technological age. All you have to do is go to Google and go, uh, just type in what is Islam, what is Islamism, and you're going to get the answers. Um, of course, there will be different versions. So I'm going to begin uh, in two ways. One is I'll talk about my experience being a Muslim. Um, and then also uh, basically just try to shed light into the definition between Islam and Islamism. So I think you deliberately named it Islamism, right, Chula? I was wondering at one point whether yeah, uh, yeah. it, yes, okay. It's the first time I'm also seeing that we are talking on this topic head on, you know? Yeah. So as Chula alluded to it, Islamism is a movement within Islamic society that believes a state should revert to the more traditional and fundamental aspects of Islam and that uh, Islam should guide social, political, as well as per personal life. Uh, so, or some say it's also the belief that Islam should influence political systems. And, and that is a huge struggle for Muslims, for us who are moderate Muslims uh, within, the, within the community. Uh, now, Islam, on the contrary, is the faith of about uh, 6 billion people. 
Islamism is not a form of the Muslim faith or an expression of Muslim piety. Rather, I would conclude by saying it is a political ideology that strives to derive legitimacy from Islam. So you, we now roughly basically have an idea of what it is to be, what, what is Islam? It's a faith that originated 1400 years ago. And then Islamism is the, uh, is the effort to convert it uh, into a, a political movement where some, I mean, some people feel that uh, Islam should um, provide the answers and uh, should guide uh, politics and uh, global affairs. So that's where, that's the difference. Um, so I, I was born of, in Sri Lanka, born to a Muslim family. My father was Muslim. My grandfather was a very uh, committed, well-known and a well-recognized Muslim in the community. We know that during the COVID, uh, the, the cremations, which were Ill, on ill-founded reasons, uh, really uh, divided the communities. Um, so going back to my topic uh, on Islam, as you all know, uh, so Islam was a, a religion revealed to Prophet Muhammad uh, in the seventh century. Um, and uh, he, he was praying in, uh, so before Islam, we know there was Judaism, and then there was Christianity, and then came Islam. So Prophet Muhammad was uh, uh, an orphan, and uh, he, um, he grew up without his mother, with his uncle. And then he, the story is that he retreated many often to the Mount Hira. And there he, he had um, uh, an, uh, an experience where revelations were kept coming to him, uh, like came to Moses for Jude Jews and then uh, of course, in Christianity, there's no uh, revelations that were delivered, but uh, Christians believe that Jesus himself taught them what Christianity was. Um, well, that is today in, a, in their holy book. Um, so, so when prophet was in this mountain, uh, he would hear uh, from angel Gabriel messages. And then he would... Um, he would come to his wife, Khadija, at that time, uh, a woman who was about 25 years older than him, whom he was married to. And he worked for her and uh, he, uh, he, he, he played a very subordinate role to his wife, which we don't see today, where there's a lot of patriarchy and uh, there's a different kind of uh, uh, power that is vested in the Muslim male dominant and it's where there is a lot of dominance from the male segment of the community towards what Islam is and women's scholarship is not that recognized, especially in, in Sri Lanka, I would say. So he, he, he got this message and he came and told his wife the significance of him confiding first in his wife, how he comforted her and she became the first Muslim. And when I contrast this with the story of Jesus Christ and the Catholicism, it was Mary Magdalene who found Jesus crucified. Uh, and she's the one who went and announced to the world uh, the, the, about the crucifixion, that he's, he, he has, he's being crucified. If not for her role that was played that day by and a few other women, uh, the question we beg to ask is, would we have even known uh, the story around Christianity and the crucifixion. And, and in, 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 the, in the Christian world and in the Catholic world particularly, this story is not, not told. And because I work in the area of religion and gender, uh, we have, I, I know women, who's work, women who are working on the Magdalene Project. Uh, hundreds of books have been written today that uh, the importance of Mary Magdalene in the revelation uh, story so likewise, so with Islam, you know, the role Khadija played, his first wife played, uh, is not, uh, uh, is spoken of in a very romantic, nostalgic way, but it is not 
spoken of in a way for equality and equity in the community for women. And as you all must know, there was an article which I shared also on the Lean the Leads WhatsApp group, the struggle for Muslim women to have equal rights and better family laws is, ongo is ongoing. So we, we know that. So then, of course, he, he, he was in Mecca and then we had, he was trying to preach this theology and there was a lot of conflict with the Jews. Um, but, and he was very conciliatory trying to preach the, preach the, the religion. And then because of the fact that there was so much infighting, he left and he went to Medina. I think he was in Medina for 10 years. And there he gained power. He built himself. Uh, the, the, I look at religion, the history of religion and the belief of a religion are two different stories. So there are people who believe um, and then there are, and, and because I explore the histological context in which Islam emerged, uh, I arrive at different conclusions. So Islam, uh, then, then the prophet came back uh, to Mecca. And then I think he had formed his tribes. He was more powerful. And we see a little bit of a militant kind of Islam in Mecca after he came back. And uh, then, of course, there were, as we built on, as the Muslims gained power and built on the power, uh, the, there were some very transactional uh, negotiations that happened with the Jews and the Christians. They had to pay taxes and they had to obey certain rules. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and, but, but there was also very much evidence of peaceful coexistence as long as you didn't challenge uh, the Islam. Uh, and there were also instances where if you challenge, you could still, you know, there was love and compassion that was preached. So, um, so then Islam, then, then the prophet, uh, of course, lived to, to be over a little, little over 65 years. And during that time, after his first wife Khadija died, he married 10 other wives. Um, so in the context, these marriages happen to unite tribes for peace uh, and for several other reasons. Um, so so, so the, the important story that Muslims advance is that the prophet was very faithful to his first wife who was older. Uh, and then of course he entered into this series of marriages with other uh, women later on. Um, so, so having said that, um, he, he died uh, when he was 63, I think, yes. And uh, thereafter, the huge problem arose as to the succession. They, there we have the divide of the Shia and the Sunnis. Uh, the, the, the Sunnis say that there was no successor that was named by the Prophet. But the Shia say, no, the, the successor was Ali, who was his... Uh, um, Ali was his um, grandson, yes, grandson. So in, the, in Iran, you find the Shia branch of Islam, whereas in Saudi Arabia, you find the Sunni branch of Islam. And in Sri Lanka, I'm a Sunni Muslim. I'm told I'm a Sunni Muslim because we followed uh, the, 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 the histor historical story that there was no successor. So therefore, automatically, uh, I think the Sunnis are in a majority of over eighty percent of Muslims are Sunnis, um, and then of course the Shia is a very small number, and there's conflict between that group. Uh, and uh, growing up in Sri Lanka, I'm I'm sure if you were also grew up in Sri Lanka, you might not have even heard of this divide. There's a there's a there's a Western hand in really reinforcing this divide. And then we, in, in the Muslim world, we have hegemonic dictator lead, dictators who are leaders and uh, it's easy to manipulate them um, for, uh, for, for, for Western countries to, to for the, they're going to stay in power. Uh, so, so then the divide, I'm not going to blame it only on the West. Muslim community has to, Muslim leaders have to take responsibility for 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 solidifying this divide, uh, so 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 that's what happened with um, that's where we are today, uh, and then uh, there are uh, some schools of thought 
Um, there are four schools of thought, Hanafi, Hanbali, Shafi, and Maliki. They're all Sunni schools of thought. Um, yeah, so before, as, yeah, Allah means the Arabic word for God and how Muslims refer to their God. Uh, next one. Yeah, anybody who is a follower of the religion of Islam is a Muslim. Yeah, inspired teacher of the, who teaches the will of Allah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is something that the Muslim takes, Muslims take great pride in, that the Prophet Muhammad came and told the revelation and it was written, it was scribed in uh, whatever way at that time was appropriate. But to this date, nothing has changed from that revelation in the original Arabic version. So the Muslims uh, believe, uh, like just like the Christians believe, well, Jesus was the son of God. Uh, Muslims believe the Quran was the last word of God. So it is sacrilegious to even suggest that we change anything in the Quran. Even to change the understanding uh, is met with a lot of resistance because it is claimed to be the last word of God, sent to the last prophet of God. So those two can't change in the Muslim world. Next one. Yeah, Quran, as you all know, is the holy book of Islam. Uh, and the Quran, what happened for us when you talk about the Quran is that uh, Saudi Arabia is economically uh, such a mag power to deal with. So at that time, around that time, a Wahhabi, a Wahhabi branch of Islam began to spread. Uh, they, uh, they kind of really, I mean, for lack of better words, they, they bribed Muslims to embrace Wahhabism. And in return, they gave them economic benefits. They printed the Saudi version of uh, many Qurans. And I, we, I'm, I'm, I, I say this with great uh, authenticity that Islam was hijacked by the Wahhabis. What uh, we did, how much the Saudi Wahhabism took back Islam uh, to a very medieval state. Uh, so if what happened to in Sri Lanka is also not to be forgotten. When I went to school, I attended a Muslim, all girls Muslim school. Uh, we, we never covered our hairs. We were very culturally tuned to the, the Sri Lankan culture. Uh, but we wore a long dress and a, and a, and a shirt and a long uh, and pants. And then we would cover the bosom that the, the Quran specifically says, cover your adornments. Uh, it doesn't mean like what we see today, the Arabic way of uh, dress was not uh, prevalent. My, not even my great-grandmother wore that way. But that was because of the Saudi uh, Middle Eastern influence, women who went to uh, the Middle East to work. And then there were a lot of theologians trained by the Saudi Middle Eastern brand of Wahhabi Islam. So when they came back, they preached that. And somehow... Uh, it, it spread its tentacles. There were no watchdogs at that time to speak loud enough. And then we had a lot of Muslim ministers, you know, who, who did not invest in the community. They invested in politics for their benefit. So, so then a, a, a brand of Wahhabism came to stay in Sri Lanka. And uh, that's, that's, that, uh, that, that's really uh, emerged uh, in the last decade, where there was intolerance, there was uh, gender inequities, and there was a dress code uh, that really divided uh, the Muslims from the non-Muslims. And even within the Muslim community, we have the struggle of, why are you wearing this? You know, this is not Sri Lankan. Uh, and then uh, the answer, we have different answers. It comes from a, a sense of piety. So... Um, there are five basic pillars of Islam. One is declaration of faith. You have to say, uh, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, which means there's go no God but God and Muhammad is the uh, messenger of God. We have to say that. Now today, if, if you decide to become a Muslim, you have to say that. That's the first pillar of Islam. The second is, of course, praying five times a day. 
there are five prayers, the early morning prayer, uh, Fajr, which is at around 5 a.m. Then there is the noon prayer, uh, Zohar. Then there's around three o'clock, there's another prayer called Asr. And then at sunset, there's a prayer called Maghrib. And then, uh, and then night, later in the night, uh, around eight, nine in the evening, there's what is called Isha. So Muslims pray five times a day. They face the uh, Mecca, Kaaba, and they pray. Um, so uh, it is very uh, ritualistic prayer with prostrations. And I'm not sure how many of you have gone to mosques. Uh, most mosques uh, in Sri Lanka, I see mosques are vibrant and open in the United States. Now we are beginning to create more mosques. Uh, and then on Friday is where the main prayer takes place. Uh, Friday afternoon prayer, we call it the Jumma. It's equivalent to uh, the Sunday service for Christians. And then maybe the Poya day visits by the Buddhists uh, to go to the temple. And then charity is very much stipulated in the faith. 2% uh, of your income uh, to be given uh, as charity. And then fasting uh, is during the month of Ramadan, 30 days of fasting from dawn to dusk uh, to really to um, understand hunger and to, to, to really understand what it is uh, to live in a higher state of piety and consciousness. Because I mean, it's a fact that when you are hungry, uh, there's only one thing on your mind. And when you are not, when you have eaten, there are many things on your mind. So I think uh, on a general eclectic level also fasting helps. And I, I am now for the, I don't know, Chula will know, doctor, that intermittent fasting is highly recommended in, in the medical world, uh, the benefits of which are now evident. Uh, and then uh, number five is a pilgrimage to Mecca. At least once in a lifetime, you have to go to Mecca and uh, visit the Kaaba and the places of worship of, uh, of where the prophet was. And uh, even there, you know, I, I am a fan who says we have to boycott that because Saudi Arabia has done so many things that has been of great disservice to Islam in that even, um, even the the, the Kaaba has become very commercial and, it is, and maybe they can't help it because millions visit uh, uh, the, when pay their homage, uh, the, five, fifth, the fifth, uh, fifth principle. So it's very commercial and uh, ruins of uh, the homes of Khadija, the prophet's first wife, is ruined. And we are told the Hilton Hotel was built on that. Uh, so, so, so there's a lot of contention within the community. Uh, so we have to understand is that when we hear the word Muslim, we are very contentious within. We don't all uh, subscribe to the same thought uh, and the same uh, practices, though largely these practices are undisputed. Most Muslims practice this uh, to the letter. Um, but in, ter in terms of thought, we have a lot of differences. There's the uh, conservative and the moderate and the extreme. Um, yeah, so next one. Yeah, so those are the five pillars. Uh, yeah, next one. Yeah, as, as I explained to you, Shahada, saying that... Uh, uh, then you have to declare this. There's no God, but God and Muhammad is the apostle of God. Yeah, then the second pillar is the prayer. Uh, uh, is Zakah giving money to people? 2.5% of their savings. Fasting. Then, of course, the Mecca. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I'm sure we have more questions. Uh, so it's about uh, 
spoke for about 25 minutes. Uh, what else could I say about, uh, yeah, it's so Islam is supposed, is, is supposed to be the one of the most fastest growing religions. And when I look at the Muslims, I live in the United States, uh, Muslims are the most diverse religious community in the United States, very diverse. Because a Muslim from Afghanistan and a Muslim from um, Sri Lanka, we are different, though we are closer in proximity geographically. The, so culture and tradition also play a large role into our practices as Muslims. So a Muslim from Egypt is, is a different Muslim than a Muslim from um, Nigeria. So there's so much of differences and it's, it's one of the most diverse uh, and uh, communities in the United States. Uh, now in Sri Lanka, as we know, Muslims concentration is in the East Coast. And then we have a lot of Muslims in Colombo and the Northern Muslims, uh, the, during the time of the LTT, 10,000 Muslims were given one night's notice to leave. So they went to Mana, Putlam, and they lived there. And when we talk about the ethnic conflict, you know, not much is spoken about the 10,000 Muslims who left. We always talk about uh, it being a Tamil issue, but it was also a Muslim issue. So, um, yeah, so what happens when I go to the East Coast, I do a lot of work. East, in, the, in the East Coast, we have a high level of child marriage. Uh, when I was there, there was a young girl I met and she was in tears. Um, actually, she had spoken to her teacher and the teacher uh, tried asked me to intervene that her parents were getting ready to give her in marriage. She was in, in all level, doing her all levels. So child marriage is rampant and you must know right now, we, there is the Muslim marriage and divorce laws, Mamda, that is being debated. And the women, Muslim women have taken a very strong stand against child marriage. And we have wanted to be stipulated that 18 years would be the minimum age for marriage but we have Muslim MPs, we have Muslim religious actors who have after nine years agreed to 18 years, but they want a proviso, a caveat that under exceptional circumstances, the religious imam or the father has a right to decide. Now that, is, that spells disaster for the years of work, Muslim women uh, and, um, and some men who have agitated for this change. So the fight continues. We are in a fight between modernity, liberalism, technology, and uh, uh, ancient dogma. And like all communities, I think uh, there are different uh, followers and different followings that happen. So I'll open it to questions now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Saraya, for that brief. Uh... Uh, uh, explanation for us to understand. So I'll stop your slides here and then maybe open for discussion uh, for any questions. So in Sri Lanka, the uh, problem I will ask a question in Sri Lanka, the problem has been is uh, all the religions are getting heavily politicized for their advantage. And that's another aspect that has walked into it. So uh, either religions themselves are not dangerous, but what has happened is all these various other things like the you know, rituals and rifts and everything else, which I showed, has actually undermined the original teachings. Any ideas how to overcome this? Anything? Anything? <laughs> So mm -hmm. here's what I must say in all honesty, because I feel we must speak the truth. Unlike Buddhism, Buddha, it was non-violence was a cardinal value of Buddhism, right? It's at the root of Buddhism. Um, in, my, uh, in my understanding, there is, uh, it is not so in Islam. Uh, so uh, the, the, the Islam that was preached in the Middle East uh, was to a Muslim majority country. And there are so many countries in the world who have accepted religion, theocracies, where they, they, they use religion as a political uh, 
uh, for politics. Uh, and, and you're right, Chula, in Sri Lanka, this didn't happen, but it began, I think we must sadly accept that with the with giving Buddhism a preferential position. And then uh, that I think became a very challenging issue that can be discussed. Some would say no, but Buddhism is special because the Buddhists have no other country to go to. Um, and that's a debatable issue. But uh, when we had successive leaders who came and who undermined the other faiths, yeah, so then people become militant. And I, I saw that happen also in, in the Muslim communities. They were fighting for survival. Uh, and, uh, and some of those fights were wrong. Is, is the same diversity that you're talking about uh, prominent in Sri Lanka? Between Muslim communities? Uh, not as much, but yes. Like, for instance, we have yeah. the uh, Sufis in, 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 uh, in the East. Yeah. which the Sunnis were trying to destroy their places of worship. So um, I don't know if you heard of this Sufi saint called Bhava Moinudi. He has, uh, the, there's a place in Ratnapura where he has, his, he, was, he was enshrined. He was so persecuted. He came to the United States and in Philadelphia, he opened one of the largest uh, religious places of worship for Sufis. Now, Sufism is a very soft brand of Islam where they incorporate music and dance and the love of the divine. You know, Rumi spoke a lot about Sufism. And that is uh, that is not palatable with some other hardcore Muslims. Yeah, so at one point there was a lot of rift, but it is not as global. The rifts are not global. It's more like culture uh, merged with the religion. Any, any other questions? I've got a few, but I want others to ask questions. Okay, yeah, Kisiri, so yes. may I, yeah. Actually, uh, the, uh, first of all, we have to thank, uh, I don't know whether Miss Dean or Mrs. Dean. Just yes, say yes, Soraya, uh, please. We have to, huh? Soraya. Yes, right, Soraya. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Soraya. Some of the facts, most of the facts we already know, but uh, I have a small question about uh, the population of religions. Uh, you said that 32% of uh, the population, world population are Christian and 15% or so for um, Islam like that. Uh, but this may be, I think this may be correct about 10 years ago. Because earlier, earlier because we were, we were, when a uh, child was born, especially in Sri Lanka, he is forced to go to a particular religion, either Buddhist or Christian or Islam or whatever it is. The parents make the children uh, some religious people, right? But now, as the, after especially this, this uh, scientific education developed in the world, people have a lot of understanding about all the religions. For example, myself, I have read the Quran, I have read the Bible, I have read Buddhist books and all. There are so many people. And now there are uh, non-religion or free thinkers in the world. So present statistic is not the same as you want to uh, mention. Uh, because now, uh, as far as I know, I heard uh, in America there are 14% non-religion people. Because they don't, uh, they don't like to say whether he is a Christian, he is Muslim, he is a Buddhist. Because he has under, he has read a lot of religious books and he has taken the truth or the essence of all the religions, right? Mm. Then of course he never. There are a lot of people. For example, I never go to temple, I never go to church, I never go to Islam. I have my understanding about Buddhism uh, because there are, there are some particular these things which are. Correct, it can be applied to the whole world, the Buddha's teaching. Mm. Uh, like that, there may be some Islamic teaching also which can be applied to the whole world. So there are people who are um, understanding these things uh, through reading, actually. Uh, you can't uh, make, make, you can change your mind after going to a temple or so, because the Buddhist temple, the, for example, the Buddhist monks teach whatever he read in the books. He never think scientifically he never uh, preached like that the uh, christian uh, priest and all for example pope pope asked uh, people my wife is a uh, christian uh, the pope asked christian to the pray for diseases but pope went for a uh, for, to the he entered to, uh, to a hospital to get uh, his heart or something operated 
So he, he does something. He asks people to do prayers. Like the Buddhist monks uh, ask us to say some gatha to uh, cure our deal. But there are, uh, there are you know, Dr. Chulana knows very well, in all the hospitals, there is a special ward for Buddha, uh, these monks. But they ask us to say some gatha and treat our ailment. So therefore, the people have understood now. There are so free thinkers, so non religious people now. So there are, I think, the uh, correct, the present statistics is not the same <laughs> what you have, uh, what you have uh, mentioned, actually. That's my one idea. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, mm. So, are you saying there are more? Are you saying there are more non-religious people, secular? Yes, yes. Because non-religious okay. people, they are, they are free thinkers. We, we don't have any problem in the mind because they take, they take the essence of all the religions and practice the best part. Right, right. Well, I say myself, I, I, I believe there is a particular God. I don't know whether you know that. Sabba Baba Sakana Kusra Sopadamasa Church Chitta Pariyodama Eta Buddha Sasana. That is the essence of Buddhism. It says, mm. don't do bad things. Do good things. And you have to have your, your own head clear, not other sins. You have to, then that is Buddhism. Yeah, so, sure. So you you could I, be right because the research that I found, I just posted it on the chat. Hmm. Uh, it's it's a little old. Uh, hmm. And I don't think a, a comprehensive study has come since then. Uh, I, I checked the few, few polls also, it was not there. So yes. that numbers could have shifted, certainly would have shifted, yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Saraya. Thank you. Thank you, Kitsuri. Thank you Where are you based, Kitsuri? I am in Kandy now. Uh, oh, okay. I, I was in several countries and I was doing my master's and everything, UK, USA, Japan, China and everything. But now I am a part-time lecturer at the Peradina campus. Uh, visiting lecturer, so I am living in Kandy. I see, love my hometown. <laughs> Kandy yeah, he's a, he's a climate there. expert, uh, sorry. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so you must be knowing uh, uh, Larif Zubair. Uh, yes, yes. He's a very good friend of mine. I see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Kisiri, I would want you to join on eighth. August, we are talking about Buddhism, and then you will be able to talk a little bit about it as well. Okay, Dr. Chula. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll thanks, try my yeah. best. So, it's uh, very good. Uh, any other comments or questions from uh, the audience? Mm. So, sorry, you, you know a lot. I mean, the thing is, the world is changing, as as uh, you said. The There are two issues that's very recently talked about. Why the boys are not learning very well in school is another one issue. So that uh, very soon, or maybe another 20 years down the line, uh, the most dominance will be in, in the women who are doing very administrative jobs. So that's coming on at the moment. Even at university education, the number of boys entering is less. That's number one. Number two is there's a population born after 1996, and they have a different term. They think differently. Uh, so they are called a different group. I can't remember the name. But then their influence will come, as Kitsiri said. Uh, so the things, the world will change, but then... How can we kind of come together in Sri Lanka to make sure that there'll be peace so that the country can develop? How can we do that? Oh, okay. So I think in Sri Lanka, what I see is that the citizens have for a long time abrogated their rights. And we thought the politicians will guide us and take us to this, uh, to this, uh, to this world where there will be peace and harmony but does not happen for decades. I think what I'm seeing very clearly is that in small villages, in big towns, people must unite. People must come together and, you know, stand up for one another and have open communication, especially on issues of faith. Like for instance, when, um, when, when this Muslim community, uh, like the, I was there personally when the Digana riots happened, uh, there it it it's it started 
for two reasons. One is there was a subtle buildup of animosity towards the Muslims. And I think what we, the Muslim, didn't do correct was they were also alienating themselves with their dress, with their newfound piety. They were building a different culture for themselves in that village. And it was it was alien to the villagers. So that that both of that came together, a distrust was formed, and then it was very easy to um, to 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 burn uh, the businesses of Muslims because uh, we also know there's a lot of economic um, jealousy that happens, and then um, they burnt the house of this man and his son died inside. A lot of things that happened. So it, it, the root of that, I believe, is, is was trust, the lack of it. So, but if we are going to create a better uh, community, I don't think the people in Candy can bring uh, understanding to Colombo. It would be great if they could. I would say Candy to work on its own, build strong networks of communities and, and, and address challenges that comes within the community. And in order to do that, of course, the first principle would be to acquire an appreciative understanding. And that's what I'm seeing that you're trying to do, uh, Chula, is to really put a face to these religions, you know, put a relationship, put feelings that we are all in this together. And, and um, yeah, and, and for, I'm speaking for the Muslim community. We have to do a lot of work. We can't uh, sit where we are. We have to do a lot more reach out especially the women need to be more robust and involved, which is not happening. Uh, and then uh, I believe that we should have cultural events. Like when we were young, there was so much that happened uh, to bring the community together. Yeah, and of things, course, not to forget, yeah. but what happens positive. at the dinner table is important. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, more positive things are happening anyway. Say, for example, the university entrance of a Muslim uh, girls and boys is higher than it was maybe when we were entering. And uh, so their education levels are going up, whereas uh, in our time, the education was not taught uh, as the priority at that particular time in 1970s. So, so things are changing. So, but, um, and also rioters. Now the question is rioters, whenever there's an issue, the rioters will pop in and those rioters are more or less the same. <laughs> Whatever the religious issue, the rioters coming and they uh, they will just uh, steal things, do things that to their personal advantage. And that's what uh, that happens, not only in Sri Lanka, elsewhere as well. So, the, uh, so this issue is there, but then when there's no law and order, then these things propagate very fast. And uh, that's you have seen in Sri Lanka as well as elsewhere as well. So the law and order has to come in to get some sense on it. But depoliticizing yes. religion from uh, actual religion is what matters. I don't know how we can achieve it, but we should say something about the core understandings. That's why I thought it's better to discuss wise. Mm. Uh, depoliticizing. You use the word depoliticizing. Depoliticizing, yeah. So are you, yeah. So are you suggesting these conversations take place in religious places of worship? No, no, well? no. It's not that. It's not that. The question is, people use uh, religion to support something, and then politicize it. So, say for example, you will say you want to build a mosque uh, somewhere very close to uh, Andhradhapur or something like that. Yeah. So then uh, you create an issue on this politically and then get the local people to support and then get violent on it as well. So mm -hmm. this is happening and that's the issue that was there. Even the Easter Sunday attack, uh, people say there was politics behind it. I mean, people know it will, will tell you. And it was a conflict created between Muslims and uh, Christians. But in fact, it was not. That is what we believe. It was a propagated mm -hmm. political activity. So, so these things happen, and unfortunately, people fall into the trap and then get all get involved with it. 
Right. This is the problem. And then also to to shed some light into the politicians who are fermenting this, right? No, the, uh, the quality, say for example, today, even we don't have a vision for Sri Lanka's development. Everything happens under the carpet and then you know, certain things prop up from time to time. There's no, say, five-year development plan or a 10-year development plan. And everything changes when the, when the government change. That doesn't happen in properly developed countries, developing countries. They have their policies. So the that is what we should focus on, even with the religions and everything. We need to focus on just let them do what they have to do because... The religions don't bring damage to countries. They actually bring more civilization, I hope. So that is useful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yes, and then also I, I feel that I don't know when this will happen in the situation in Sri Lanka. The large majority of politicians, they have to also speak a language of unity uh, and I don't know whether we can even change the current team in a hurry. Uh, so the, I think the activity has to happen politically, then communally, then uh, in schools. I think it's a whole uh, whole approach that has to take place. And in order to launch that, what I'm hearing you say is that we don't have a policy like that. Is that what you're saying, Chula? We don't have a policy in the country. Say, for example what the government has planned to do this year, next year, the following year, in relation to development, it's not there. So the manifestos are not followed, even if there's a manifesto. Um, obviously, the current government doesn't have a manifesto because the president is the one who just came through the back door. So there's no, 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 no development policy as such. So these things are a problem. And the second thing is, obviously, uh, the most politicians in in governance at the moment, uh, talk just it's not visionary. For example, so there's they don't bring in a new activity to get people together or promote peace or or at least to tolerate the hardship for this time, so that we can survive and then get up from the current uh, dismal situation, and so on is not really spoke about by anybody. Because they don't have that vision. That's the trouble. So, but as we heard over and over again, the political system, although we ask for fairness in political system, the political design itself is unfair. So that not a people don't see that that the system is unfair itself, even if all the elections were peaceful. That's uh, those are the things that needs to be addressed. So, but. It's good to at least learn that such a thing is there, and then uh, if you if you if you sorry you want to promote peace in Islam in Sri Lanka, is there say five activities that you can propose or something like that? Oh, okay. So for me, uh, in fact, I was trying to do some research on this and to get. Uh, to first to understand the constituency, the Muslim, the way the, the distribution of Muslims in the United States uh, have to be understood. Where are the Muslims, how many, and what cities which have more Muslims and what cities have less. And then, because I was wanting to work within the, within the religious spectrum, because in, in, in the Muslim community, it's hard to empower only the woman and say, leave the man out because they won't they're dependent on the men for for strength and economic necessity and all of that so we were trying to infuse the mosques with a with a women's center you know like a like like in the united states uh, after prayers we have a women's group that meets regularly and we take on small issues that can impact the community what I find in the Muslim world is that we work at half steam. Only the male men are addressing all these issues. So we want to we want to increase women's participation, and it is happening. I won't say no. I think Jahan Pira and the Peace Council have done a lot of work to bring more women in, but we can uh, build on that. Um, so for me, when I look at my 
my personal experience of what happened in Sri Lanka is that we we grew up in a very diverse pluralistic society and that trajectory changed with a lot of what we call Islamism. There were some clergy and men who came into the community and who started to preach this superiority doctrine uh, which must uh, which must which which has we should have no place in our in our society no religion is superior no community is superior so to really um, make the younger generation understand and to embrace that would also be critical uh, so i would i would focus on women and the youth and um, how to bring more women to the temple muslim women and more women from the temple to the mosque and to build some level of cohesive relationships that is something that i might uh, that i think i have worked on uh, that uh, that i i got stuck with the research and i was during the pandemic uh, we were trying to establish women's uh, groups in mosques so that we could uh, have a more robust uh, engagement of the muslim community can I ask you know, okay, okay, yes. Uh, it's really there's uh, Susanta is also raising yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, Susanta, let, let, me, let, let me speak, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank okay. you, Saraya. Thank you uh, very much for uh, this uh, talk. And uh, we really appreciate that you, uh, you uh, propose that we have to talk very honestly about religion. And we don't have to be politically correct when we talk about uh, religion. So uh, thank you very much. My uh, my problem is now we talk about on the one hand we talk about the reconciliation coexistence between different uh, religious communities, and at the same time we keep on programming our children in different uh, religions. Uh, so what I feel is that uh, if you can stop that. Uh, religious programming of children, the toddlers who can't understand anything, and uh, you know, make them uh, cast iron uh, uh, devotees of different religions. Uh, why not uh, allow them to give a chance to select their own religion? Because what I feel uh, is that we have uh, we talk about. Uh, human rights, and we say that we have the right to choose our religion. So uh, in a very uh, kind of uh, benevolent way, we just try to pressure the, the parents' religion, impose the pa parents' religion on uh, children. I think that is, the, that is a grave violation of uh, human rights. So now we talk, about, when you talk about religion, we always talk about humanity, love, compassion, and all that. So when you try to teach religion to children, actually you begin it with violating one of the basic human rights. So uh, on the one hand, we talk about reconciliation. On the other hand, we pump uh, these different doctrines uh, to children who can't understand anything at their age. So why not stop that simply and mm. let them let them uh, choose their religion when they come to that appropriate age where they can understand the complexities mm. of religion. That is uh, my uh, uh, my idea. Thank you. Mm. I I agree with that. But look at where we are with. The, with the ordination of young children in the Buddhist uh, community, which is a huge issue that is, is at another high level, you know. And then, yes, I agree, but what you suggest, Susanta won't fly with the Muslim community because we are like very, very set uh, with our identity as Muslims. Uh, and, and, and I think. Um, we can have that, but we can also teach the children uh, pluralism. Pluralism, you know, the, we mix the meaning of the two, diversity and pluralism. Diversity is a given. Look at the seven of us here. We are diverse. We have only look at one of other to see how different we are. But pluralism is that celebration of that diversity. I think we have to teach that. 
and and uh, and and I like Susanta's idea of not to indoctrinate our children, but I I don't know in a large scale how successful we are going to be uh, in in telling parents that. Yeah, that is uh, that is actually a very uh, practical uh, problem uh, because everybody is, I think, uh, is in a kind of competition to teach his own religion to uh, his progeny and uh, yeah. propagate that. So I think that competition, we can't uh, do away with that competition. But uh, I think uh, this kind of conversation is really important because we can mm -hmm. just discuss these issues. And my actually, my suggestion is that you know, along with temples and mosques and churches, uh, we have to have discussion centers where we can discuss these issues openly without having any kind of enmity towards uh, each other. Uh, so for that, actually, we now, uh, for example, why should we just talk about the etymology of uh, religion, the origins of religion? If the uh, any social institution must have some kind of purpose. If religion is a social institution and one of the most important social institutions, um, why not, uh, you know, have, uh, uh, why not, uh, you know, free the people, uh, the, the toddlers of this and let them decide on their own. Once again, I'm telling uh, and decide for themselves because because we are just breeding breeding people who are blindly devoted to their religions and and what we know the essence of religion what I feel is that is the morality I mean if there is no no morality there is no use of religion because anybody can uh, definitely anybody can make a deep study of uh, any religion of his choice, Buddhism, Christianity, anything. He can be a scholar. That, that's a different thing. But why should we uh, have that issue with uh, this moral uh, teaching? Because morality is, it is all human. I mean, there is no Christian morality or Muslim morality. When you say, uh, when you talk about a good man, you can't say he's a good Christian. If you don't know his religious background, you can't say he's a good Christian or good Muslim. He's just a good man. So why not actually forget uh, uh, this, you know, where this thing came from, where this, uh, by, what, what is so uh, holy or sacred about uh, 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 kind of uh, moral code? And why not take the essence and then have a, kind of, uh, you know, a broad basing of this morality where everybody can get together and come under one banner without, you know, having these very religious dis distinctions. Mm. Uh, because because we, we talk about religion and at the drop of a word, we are re ready to kill for our religion. I mean, this is re really ironical. This, this is really yeah. ironical. That's true. That's true. It's very, very challenging question you pose, Susanta. I... You know, I uh, I have a lot of interfaith interactions. I created the largest interfaith solidarity network in Los Angeles. Every year we bring thousands of people together and we do a march. And because of my work, my Jewish friend, Marsha Novak and I, we got the Los Angeles Impact Maker Award because we made such a huge difference. And what I found in the Jewish community is that there is there is an ex acceptance of secularism for Jews. There is an acceptance of, of uh, 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 orthodoxy for Jews. There's an acceptance of progressive. The numbers are so large, they have created those groups for themselves. Now, in my community, if I say I'm a secular Muslim, I will not be recognized. That, that In that statement alone is the charge that you're not a good Muslim. Uh, so the, 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 the inbuilt, ingrained, cemented thought is so deep. Uh, and I, 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 I think, you know, in fact, I was, uh, I don't know if you know Satguru, the mystic from India. Yes. 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 He was in Los Angeles uh, three weeks ago. That was his last tour. And I, I, I went, I, we had this, we, we, we had an initiation. I'm a, I'm a Muslim, but I, I enjoy the spirituality and secularism of the world that is also as mean, is so meaningful. And then I thought, wow, it'll be nice for me to start a movement called Secular Muslims. <laughs> because we need that, what you say, 
because we are all into this book and the text and the preaching, uh, we, 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 we don't see it larger to uh, another possibility without all the stories we tell, you know, this is the, 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 the certainty is killing religious people, you know, the certainty of their beliefs. Uh, but again, I must admit, um, on a Sunday when you wake up and go, go to the church, there will be 25 people having a food drive. That is because religious communities are also organized communities. Uh, so people of no belief, atheists, for instance, I mean, I have yet to see them organize a food drive and do such charitable work in the community. Uh, so the Catholic Church, if we know, it's not just the Catholicism, but they built the largest schools and the uh, hospitals and the, uh, and the libraries. They've done a lot. So how can we take the best of the both and merge it would be a, a project to explore. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Mm, I mean, it's thank really you. refreshing, refreshing to talk to you, to talk yeah, to a person yeah. like you. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know, and we are we are both talking of possibilities and opening That's a right. space for discussion. Yes, that is yes. what is lacking, I would say, in the religious world, isn't it? Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. Yes, thank you yeah, for that thank question. You. Thank you, Santa. Yes, Kitsiri, Yes, Kitsiri, it's you. Actually, yes. Uh, can it, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, actually, uh, we have to thank uh, Susan also. He pointed out a uh, nice uh, thing. Uh, if possible, uh, whenever we can give the freedom of choosing a religion to the people, that is the, the peaceful day. I don't know when it will happen because our politicos are political. They can't understand any religion. I have because I have written so many letters to politicos, even the education minister can't understand the real facts of religions. I, I, have, I have proof. I have written and uh, I have talked to talked with the Bandula and some uh, uh, political people uh, because they follow whatever the people like. They go to the temple today, they go to the mosque tomorrow, they go to the um, church day after tomorrow and worship. And they don't know what is the real, um, the real uh, the facts or real religion to be selected real um, truth, right? That is one thing. Uh, so therefore, until we make, the people have to get to this, uh, so I was telling, the we, we have to get to that, we must be very brave to talk the truth to the people, including politicos. But uh, Sri Lanka, of course, people are very reluctant to talk the truth. That is a problem. And uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the I, mean, I, I don't talk very much about the Hinduism and uh, Islam and Christianity, where there are so many things to be talked. Uh, the, right, but Buddhism, the Buddhist monks, because we have two temples in Sri, in, in my village, they are doing a very bad thing. That is noise pollution, right? Every day in the morning they start their loudspeakers. You know there are so many students who are doing their studies in the morning, but they are all disturbed. So I had to fight with one monk actually because they they don't know the environment authority rules and regulations. They don't know whether the sound is a pollution. They don't know everything. So I had to um, put, I had to give him the circulars of the environment authority. Then of course, fortunately, uh, one uh, one temple, they reduced the volume, but still I went and talked. And uh, after so many discussions, of what they had to stop. And there is a Islam a Muslim uh, mosque there. They also early morning, further they start their uh, shouting, right? Allah, like that. Everybody is disturbed. So these things have must be understood by at least the educated people. They must be educated. First of all, they must know this belief and other things are not, uh, not correct. Because if you are a scientist, you must have uh, heard about the Big Bang Theory. How the, how the universe was started, there was no creation. And then, of course, you must have read the evolution, right? We, we were, uh, we were, uh, uh, we were uh, not, we were Homo sapiens about 130,000 years ago. We were all uh, uh, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens. Then we uh, started from Africa to go to the whole world, and with those two went to Europe. They they became fair. Those two went to Africa. They became uh, dark. Those two went to those homo sapiens went to the India, they are uh, neither black or no, no fair. So that's how the, then they started language. And they, they, you have to, at least the educated people should know 
uh, uh, there, there is no God. Our universe was a result of a big bang. They are a proof. And then we are not, uh, we are not human. We are not re reborn. We were not reborn. We are uh, evolved from the monkeys, right? Then, of course, if the, at least the educated people understand that part, then they know there is no point to having different, different religions, right? Then they must come to a conclusion. They must study all. Actually, uh, the other thing is uh, our uh, Buddhist people don't like to read Bible. That's a very bad thing. Or even Quran, they just neglect as uh, what is this bloody book like that, right? No, you have to read everything. I have read all, all the Quran. I have got a single copy as well as an English copy. I have read two, two three by the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you have to read them and must get the essence of that one. Right? And Jesus Christ is not a son of a God. He was a son of a man. The Maria married to a man. He was a son of a man. So if he's a man of a God, why the God was... Uh, visualizing that uh, the Jesus Christ was uh, carried carried to a place and uh, put some fine nails on the body. He was much was, was fought now. And why this uh, bomb, bomb blast in uh, Sri Lanka, five, ch some churches, why God was uh, keeping his eyes closed? He was uh, come, to the, come to the church and told the father, uh, father I said there is uh, one, one man is coming with the woman. No, you have to send the people, the prayers, uh, praying people home. Why did, why did the, the God, if there is a God, he must have come before the um, CCTV cameras. <laughs> so there are so many proof to say there, there was no God and we are human beings and faith is the bad thing. Faith and belief is a very bad thing even the educated people have in their head. You must not faith in you. You must, you must question and question and get the facts and, and see the reality and accept the reality. Right? So that's, I don't know, my words are, you can understand. These things are written in the newspapers, but no one published these, news, these ideas. Even our media is... We, all the media are biased, therefore they are also reluctant to publish our, our articles and our ideas. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chula. Thank you, Soraya. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kitsuri. I mean, uh, since there's nobody else uh, raise their hands, I'll just, you just summarize a couple of things uh, from that. Uh, now, we were talking about indoctrination. Now, what are the worst things? that's happening in Sri Lanka is that we force very young children to become monks. Now, that's not something that is actually said in Buddhism to be done in that way. So, so it has to be through understanding that you become a monk rather than through this way of teaching. So, so in the, uh, say, for example, Western world, I don't know about US, in the UK, you have religious studies as a subject, but they give an idea about every religion to some extent for the children. So, so not just force one in their studies in the school. So the other thing about uh, going to temples, going to uh, mosques and 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 uh, church, for example, there is a scientifically kind of uh, understanding and with some evidence that it's actually helpful because when you go to the church or when you go to uh, temple, you, a group of people with the same vibe, same vibration comes together. So that makes their thinking more powerful, achievements more powerful. And if you look at, uh, there is uh, new information about what is called um, uh, uh, vibration in the brain. Okay, so that's certain frequencies. Uh, we could not measure beyond like uh, 5200 cycles per second uh, for some time but now people are measuring higher frequencies going up to like 1000 in the EEG so the frequency actually what you have in your brain relates to your emotions say for example if you are very low in frequency you are angry man you are uh, kind of very uh, can be aggressive and so on so if you are very high frequency in your brain you become uh, more like enlightened, more peaceful, a lot of love and, and things like that. So, so there is a scientific medical background to 
what is happening and the vibration in one place together with several people having the same vibe works better for every one of them. So I don't understand exactly what it is. This is a little bit of science that's coming from from uh, the 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 investigation. So we are learning a little bit about exactly how things happened, why things were done. Uh, so we can't really reject anything as such because we don't know enough of everything. And uh, what we have to see is what is good and just follow. Yeah, that's what we have to do. But it's good if we can write something up to see how to improve Sri Lankan situation, basically, how to promote harmony. Mm. Yeah, I think um, people have to be mobilized and at the same time, government should have a clear policy and we have we need leaders who are who unify the people. And people also to be taught that religion is a very personal thing. Now, when we glare, blare those things the early morning, it is very disruptive to the environment and to people. So... Yeah, that's uh, like yeah. I mean, developed countries you have rules, so you implement yeah. the rules to keep these things under control. So the uh, you cannot impeach upon other people's freedoms, etc. Uh, just quoting your religion. So, so, so that is why that is what people say that even if you are in a developed country, even if you are, don't have a religion, you are still uh, following it because of the various rules that is there. In relation to what you are doing, so, so, uh, so the uh, so that that's the thing. So we need education and implementation by rule if you want to improve. That's why the governance in Sri Lanka has to improve. So, so mm. there are things to talk about. If there's no other questions, I can conclude here, and then uh, take it up after all four presentations at a later date. Yeah. Mm. I yeah, would... I think, and uh, I would just want to add this also. I work with the International Religious Freedom Roundtable in DC. Uh, we come together every week. We have about 140 activists from all over the world coming together reporting religious freedom violations. And there are some very bad uh, countries in, in the world where based on religion, the persecution is high. Pakistan is, I don't know, the world has gone crazy, you know. Pakistan killed Priyanta Kumara, if you know a Sri Lankan, they yeah. lynched him yeah. because he removed a poster. So Pakistan brings a resolution at the United Nations Human Rights Commission that nobody should offend any religion. Now, can you believe how this law will impact minorities? And the resolution passed. A rogue country like Pakistan brings this resolution and it passed with 29 people voting for it. It's a dark day for religious freedom and human rights. So when we look around all of what is happening, what I, I keep personally realizing is Sri Lanka is still at a salvageable state. If we can escalate this dialogue, bring a level of awareness and the organize people and mobilize them, I hope we don't go to that depth where on broad day, in broad daylight, they lynch a man because he removed a poster in Arabic. Or we imprison a mother of five. This is in Pakistan. A uh, mother of five because she said something disparaging to the prophet. And they killed their minister, Mr. Tasir, because she, he defended that mother. The bodyguard shot him. And, and, and the people are joyous about it. So such is religious forever. Uh, I don't even know whether we can even have a dream on a on secular societies anymore because religion is catching up and religion is here to stay. So um, with 4,000 odd religions in the world and about 12 major majority religions, I think we have to find real ways in which we can navigate the differences and have productive conversations and not infringe on the liberties and freedoms of other people. As a Muslim woman activist, I am I am really critical of some of the records of the Muslim majority countries where 13 Muslim majority countries have blasphemy laws. And if you blaspheme, you can be killed, you can be imprisoned. 
And we saw a little bit of that rising in Sri Lanka with the arrest of Natasha because she said, she, 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 she talked about parenting and she equated that to um, Lord Buddha and she was in prison. So, so, so things are really, politicians are waiting when to catch on, to latch on to these sensitivities because uh, Pluto said religion is a very useful tool for politicians. So they are going to use it to their advantage. So, so having said that, I mean, I I must say sorry for our excesses from the Muslim world. Uh, we need a lot of work to do as a Muslim woman. I must admit that because I am always on the forefront fighting for gender equality. Because in all religions, at the at the intersection of religion and gender, religion trumps. And I don't know whether you all know that. 3,500 Buddhist bhikkhunis are denied national identity cards in Sri Lanka. Did you all know that? By the Malvatta and the, the Mahanayakas. They don't want these bhikkhunis to have equal legal status. And I did a documentary on that. May I post that? And that documentary won a global award for religious freedom. And, and, and I think Sri Lanka... Buddhism, uh, I think, wasn't it Sangamitta who brought the bow tree? Uh, yeah, there yeah. was a purpose in giving it to a woman. And we have in, in, in the United States, bhikkhunis who have been ordained in Sri Lanka, who are doing phenomenal work uh, across the United States. And they're talking about their learning. But in our own country, uh, the way we are treating these bhikkhunis uh, is a crime. So I wonder, did you know that? Sure, I I kind of understood. Yes, yeah, Susanta can say something. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, that's okay. I mean, I I, I knew about this, uh, and also uh, uh, I think irrespective of religions, I think this uh, repression of women is also uh, is a, a feature in uh, almost all religions. So yes. this uh, patriarch, uh, patriarchy is uh, Im embedded in uh, in all the religions, whether it is Buddhism or I think in Christianity or whatever. So uh, even these things actually, uh, the, these are the things that you have to discuss. But uh, but instead of discussing these things, actually, what we just we are really quarreling about who brought this and who uh, 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 the origins of religion, which is better, which. So I think we have to forget all these and distill the, the essence of the morality and just create a, a place where everybody can get together and fight the real issues. I mean, our religions are not real issues. These are actually imposed on us. We are just struggling with that and we are we are in chains from, from birth. I think we have to break those chains so that we can just get together and fight the real issues. Uh, so we can just talk about, uh, I think, the climate change and the the, the uh, disarmament, the poverty, crime, drug addiction. All these are all all uh, involved in this in this particular dialogue. But we just uh, leave them aside and then talk about, you know, uh, which one is better or why why uh, we should respect one over the other and all that kind of thing. I think that is. That is because we are just programmed. We are unfortunately pro programmed from birth uh, uh, in our religion. If if I were uh, if I were brought up in a Muslim family, I would have been a Muslim. And if you were brought up in a in a, a Buddhist family where both parents were Buddhists, then definitely you would be a Buddhist. So I I just don't know. Even you yourself said there is a lot of diversity in in uh, Muslims in different countries. So it, it actually shows that, you know, that, that it's the culture and that particular social milieu which, uh, which has uh, conditioned them. Uh, mm. So it, is, it all depends. It's a, it's a very accidental thing where we are born to this particular uh, religion. So we carry that uh, in our heads mm. and just like our ethnic sense of ethnicity. I mean, I, mm. I, don't say, I don't say that I am a Sinhalese. I have no proof of that. Of course, mm -hmm. I, my mother tongue is Sinhala, but I don't have anything in, in any Sinhala Sinhala feature in, in me. I mean, nobody will understand. Will uh, will uh, do do an experiment and find out whether I am Sinhala or Muslim or Tamil or whatever. So uh, 
And so these are actually, these are some fake uh, labels we are carrying and uh, the politicians are make the best use of that. Mm. Thank you. Now, yes, yeah, so in that regard, Susanta, to say, if we had bhikkhunis who were well-ordained with ID cards, empowered, couldn't they have been a more rational voice to these extreme Buddhist monks sure. who have desecrated Buddhism? Yeah. I mean, look at the caliber of the monks. Nanasara appointed to chair the one law yeah. commission. I mean, I can't even believe what is yeah, what yeah. happened in Sri Lanka. So yeah. likewise, when extremism is so high in the Muslim world, imagine Muslim women preaching, not only the men. Right. So I think, yeah. have and imagine in, in the churches, we saw the pedophilia and how so many millions of young children abused where there were nuns. The nuns have no rights. Our bhikkhunis are well worse. They're equal to the bhikkhus. Whereas the nuns are not, not, they're very much lower at the level in priesthood. So what I see, because I am a gender justice advocate, from the lens of gender, I feel elevating women standing in religious feminist theology uh, is very important for more peace in the world. Because I don't see a woman standing up in a mosque and saying, we must fight this and we must fight that, you know. We might more likely see something more compassionate. Being a mother and the, the tendency of women is it's also different. And there was a time I lamented a lot about when we saw the ISIS and the violent extremism that became a global crisis. Still it is. We, we didn't have enough women to guide the youth of the Muslim community. So he, 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 having said that, I'm just asking, can we, can leads take over this bikuni issue, Chula? Can we make a representation to the president or the minister of Buddha Sasana to give these bikunis their national identity card? Now, bikuni Utpalavana, whom I'm very closely working with, who's at the forefront of this fight, she went to Bangkok recently. She's in a, she's in a Buddhist attire, bikuni attire, with a lay uh, passport. And they thought she was fake. It didn't say she was not identified as a bhikkhuni. So she was taken aside. She was questioned. Why is it that it is your identity card doesn't reveal your title as a, as a bhikkhuni? So the male bhikkhus are saying, why do you need a title? Buddhism doesn't need titles. But they are having all the titles. So, <laughs> so I'm just... <laughs> So these, these are the issues. And I strongly believe, you know, the uh, patriarchy is, is legitimized by religions. And with an equal, but like what we are doing, we need a new narrative to, to, to challenge that. So uh, inspiring, uh, empowering women at the, at the intersection of religion is critical work that I am engaged in. <laughs> Yeah, we, yes, uh, actually, actually, that is a, the very weak point in Sri Lanka. The rules and regulations are not equal to everybody, right? Especially because, because the, the politicals, you know, they, they are biased. All this, they are biased, right? Uh, if a Buddhist monk or a Catholic priest or the, 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 say whatever, they say, he, they, they say the politicals have, follow them, right? They, mm. you know, that's why I, 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 early, in earlier my comment, I pointed out uh, they, the even the rules and regulations uh, are not may, are, are not equal and equal to everybody. That's why I point out that point that uh, uh, CEA, that is the Ceylon Environment Authority, have have the they have published all the rules and regulations for uh, noise pollution. But uh, mm -hmm. Buddhist, Buddhist temples and uh, your uh, mosque, uh, they they can uh, overcome those. Uh, they can make any noise even at uh, nine o'clock, ten o'clock, twelve o'clock. They can make any noise. Right? If you are going to point it out, you are, will be taken into the custody. Like that, uh, you know what happened to Sepal, Mr. Sepal. He, mm -hmm. he knows very well that there is no to Buddha's truth. I also know because there are written books. But uh, the Sepal, one Mr. Sepal, uh, he used a bad word as a point, love, right? He said love means uh, there is a nickname for the uh, Buddha's truth. He knows very well there is no Buddha's truth in the Dhanna Malga. So he used the word love. <laughs> so I, if, if, if I like that, if, if I don't believe in a God, if I know that there was a not, I can talk, talk, uh, call Balla. The, uh, the God is Balla. No. Yeah. Mm. 
ఫ్రంట్ go home uh, um, right they requested to apologize even buddhist monks went and met him and mm-hmm. then asked him to apologize and you go home i right? said what the lawyer lawyer said to judge has to do they it has to he has to be he had to be taken into the uh, what do you call that uh, usavi i don't know english term is it and asked him asela why did you call labba to the uh, to tell you so he could he could have explained it he was not given a chance so there's a problem like that uh, that uh, lady who was mentioning you you mentioned uh, the one lady's name so do the yeah mm-hmm. not that so he was, she was not given a chance to explain it right and uh, similarly i also must have been taken to kasi because in the um, fame in uh, the in the famous place i are uh, as i said so many times buddha was buddha the gaut the siddhartha did not walk on the first day of his birth he was a normal child by intelligent but he was he did not talk he he did not say that uh, agama must be local just on the same birthday first birthday he was a brainy child but he he was he could not uh, walk he was a normal this thing a normal boy so i uh, sometimes i i'll be in the custody sometimes in the future i must talk in the similar things uh, to the public people in our village <laughs> so <laughs> problem is the problem is even the i have for um, even, even the uh, politicos or the uh, the low people do not uh, do not re- request a person to talk without any fear to talk the truth they don't allow mm. okay mm. thank you the challenge uh, is going to be deep uh, the world that susanta envisaged i don't know because uh, coming from the study of religious freedom in the united states that severe emphasis on religious uh, freedom is made in the f- for foreign countries because we believe that uh, all conflict is originating from the lack of religious freedom so the so we, if we look at the amount of resources that are invested for religious freedom around the world by the united states i don't think religion will go anywhere it's come to stay and uh, people love myths some people love myths it gives them hope i have very good friends who are praying for me that i'll become a christian they're very good friends and i have very good friends who are muslim who think that i am not muslim enough uh, because they live they are all planning for the hereafter when i am living now <laughs> i my emphasis is now you know so so this is a very challenge religion by itself i think uh, with um, uh, i think there are billions of species billions hundreds of billions of species and there's 7 billion of us who are human so and to to think that we have making these rules and fighting and killing and you know doing all of this uh he said and then again at the same time some people are doing some great things also because <laughs> of their and not in spite of their belief but because of their belief so i think uh, bringing a balance might be a way that we must seriously uh look into this and and i have a friend who has launched this work called spiritual play dates where she teaches children spiritual values uh, i think catching them early on um do i do i do i see the difficulty in what susanta proposed i love that suggestion you know children should be given the freedom to decide and right now in the united states we are debating with between a conservative religious scholar who's well known he says that the the lack of uh, islam and the religious uh, guidance is that what is morally bankrupting and killing people you know it, it's it's um, it's bizarre what they talk in the name of religion and they get away and they have a following you know and he says patriarchal structures are necessary for a society to thrive so these are people also with diverse beliefs and 
they have they have a following. <laughs> all right. I think it's very good, sir. I put giving all these discussions coming up because which is very good. And you just sentenced something which attracted my eye and conscious and everything. You said lack of religious freedom as a cause of conflict in the world. You said that, isn't it? Mm. Is it possible that your group of 140 people working on this subject do a talk for us in very simple terms, showing examples of conflict because of lack of religious freedom in the world so that that will be very useful for our people also because we record and keep it so with time i think people might want to you know listen to it and understand and everything else what do you think oh on the status of the lack of religious freedom so the question is in sri lanka the problem is the the knowledge about what how things happen in the world is not well known. So bringing some mm. examples from a community like yours, which is, has got a world exposure, and giving, yes, examples, I can giving mm. examples of different countries, how lack of religious freedom and created major conflicts that's actually putting the whole communities down uh, will be useful as a learning point for us before we ourselves go into that same abyss. Mm. Mm. You think your group will be able to do something like that? I mean, it'll be good. Mm. I'm also planning to bring in some moderate clergy as well. Once we have had lay people's discussions, then that will strengthen the viewpoint because they can listen to what they, we have discussed and then they can decide how to address the issues that we have mm. as normal people have brought up. So that is also useful because otherwise they don't get exposed to their feedback from the followers. Mm. The priests don't get exposed to that. That's yes. yeah. another thing. So so yeah. there is a there is a way forward to do things. Mm. Yeah, so that's important. Mm. Yeah, I can yeah. ask. Yeah. So you uh, talked so about my question. Uh, yeah, you talked about uh, Bikuni's issue. I want to yes. bring it up in a different way. I mean, I can't just ring the secretary now and say, "Why are I not doing it?" I'm that close to the man, but I don't oh. want to do that. So I, <laughs> I will, I will, I will do it differently. So I'll probably be meeting him in about four or five months. But anyway, I, I will leave it. Secretary to... at the Ministry of Buddha Sasana. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, yeah. so I can bring it up in a different way, but but I think we ought to set the background for things to happen rather than to go from top down, it's from the bottom up. Yes. When you are in Sri Lanka, Chula, you should meet uh, the Bikuni who is heading this, uh, Venerable Utpalavanna. Okay. And ask yeah, from uh, what's happening really, yes, and how, they, how much they have struggled, they're continuing to struggle, yeah. I suppose yeah. that we can mark that as a victory for us at Leeds. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, will, I will keep it in mind and say when to take it yeah. forward. We'll see. Yeah. So, yeah. So, in Sri good. Lanka, what I'm hearing from you all is that religious freedom is a given. We have religious freedom. We are talking more of a religious nuisance. Is that what, uh, no, 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 no. what is it's, emerging? It's, it's politicized. It's, it's, the problem is it's politicized. So you can get discriminated in different areas. That's the problem because of politicization. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's what people have to understand that there's people are having a political value. I mean, it's really sad. I mean, in the, I know a very uh, monk quite closely who came from a poor family and then developed and now developing huge constructive projects saying it's all for Buddhism, but it's, it's huge numbers of money. And uh, I met him when we were in economic crisis and I told him, look, why don't you think a little bit about the children who doesn't have anything to eat in the schools and talk a little bit about trying to do that. He didn't want to do that. So imagine, imagine the uh -huh. diversity in what you teach and what you practice. I know. Uh, so there are issues, but anyway, let's see what we can do. I think today was a very good discussion. 
anything mm. else and from anybody and then we can conclude if that's not the case and we are talking about christianity next sunday oh who is speaking uh somebody from sri lanka will speak but he might bring other speakers as well but if there's anybody volunteer to speak they can join because that's how i said it so you have a lead speaker to start so if there's anybody else want to say a little bit about it that's you're welcome mm. yeah so so then by the end of the session i think we'll understand each other a little bit better and the one last thing what's the correct word for uh, the core uh, muslims that's islam or islamism uh islam is the religion okay islamism is the political now we say somebody like uh, uh, like let's say um, uh, who that uh, some some priests or anybody who promotes islam as the perfect religion as the solution we say he's an islamist right where okay. he wants to see islam as the solution to all the world's problems and so we should stick to the word Islam rather than Islamism, yeah? Yeah. So I am a Muslim. I practice Islam. Okay. And the minute I say, okay, Islam is the resolution, then I become an Islamist. All right. Okay. Because right. I'm advancing Islam as a solution to world problems. Okay. It's no longer for me. I'm not only believing, I want you to believe it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. That gives me a summary as to we talked about Islam and not the Islamism today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very so good. I then. have a question from you all. You are all not Muslims. How do you see the Muslim community should spring up? And did you see? Uh, do you see a defining Islam that was practiced before and now? And how does that impact the Sinhalese communities? And what do the Muslims need to do? Anybody to answer? Yeah. Uh, what, what, sorry, I wanted to ask really, what did I? Oh, okay. So now um, the, the Muslim community in Sri Lanka, where have we failed yeah. and what do we need to do? What happened to our relationships with the Sinhalese and the other uh, Buddhist people? Uh, has it been ruptured? Uh, if so, can it be salvaged? And what do we need to do? And what are some good things that you see in the Muslim community? Uh, actually, uh, this is not only Muslim, even the Buddhist or Catholic, whatever, whoever it is, must see the questions uh, without bias, without any bias to the religion. Right? There are so many problems. Right? So, uh, you see, I have a lot of uh, in Dantri, there are a lot of Muslim friends. Actually, I am a friend. Uh, I have a lot number of friends. So, whenever you, they talk, always they uh, talk uh, with, with some bias, bias to the religion. So the people, whether he is Christian or Buddhist or I mean, Islam, they must be, uh, what do you call that, uh, they must think independently. Right? So uh, as uh, uh, Susanta was telling, uh, uh, if a man uh, is, is, if a man does a good thing, he is a good man, not a good, good Buddhist man. Right? So uh, whether it, uh, the Muslims have to uh, think about uh, 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 all the people equally without uh, without thinking uh, without bias uh, any bias to the religion i don't know how to uh, how to teach the people like I that think, because, uh, i think it's the uh, it's the understanding i will give you one example it's actually about professionalism that's what we need i mean uh, as a medical doctor during the ltt war time I've anesthetized three or four, maybe LTT carders themselves mm -hmm. for surgery. And they knew I was a Sinhalese. But at the end of the therapy sessions, they one of them could not believe that he will have such care from a Sinhalese. So he's been indoctrinated certain things. And, and he was so honored or like to he wanted to honor me in many ways for doing that so but we were doing it without thinking about religion or race or anything we were practicing our professional duty that's what we were doing basically it's nothing in favor or nothing in antagonism we were practicing yeah. so that's what we did so that's our training has done that to us 
So we don't look at to say who is who, what religion he is, or whatever, if we have to medically help someone. So I personally experienced this myself. So, so I know that this comes from a bit more professional thinking. And I think that is something that we can promote as well. If you do this kind of discussion, then your professionalism comes into it, your humanity comes to the force. That's why it might help. Yes. Yeah, just one word. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know actually what the Muslim community in Sri Lanka can do about this, but I think uh, uh, Soraya, uh, people like you can do uh, an immense lot of service by, uh, you know, introducing uh, or opening up uh, uh, forums for discussion and then uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, lo look at their own faith in a, in a fairly objective way. Uh, so uh, I think that would uh, do some service. I, I, I agree that you know this uh, um, avoiding teaching religion to children is uh, unrealistic, but at least to understand that you know we are in this soup today because of this uh, this programming is I, I think just a tiny step towards that goal. So uh, so I think uh, we we must have a lot of discussion and uh, open and frank discussion, and I don't know how much uh, of that can happen. Uh, when you are so, uh, you know, devoted to a particular faith, and uh, yeah, that's that's it. Thank you. Yeah. To open the space for open discussion, isn't it? There yeah. are other ways. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yes. And also, I forgot to mention the Islam that springs from Muslim majority countries and the Islam that springs from Muslim minorities countries like in Sri Lanka Muslims is totally different uh, in the sense uh, very dictatorial is the Muslim majority countries. And I think in, in Sri Lanka particularly, we, 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 are, we are not as powerful. We are powerless in a sense because of the, uh, because we are only like 9% uh, of Sri Lankans are Muslims, whereas 73% Sri Lankans are Buddhists. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good place to start, you know, to have this kind of uh, eclectic conversations to introduce it. Yeah. That's probably the cultural influence that you have because yeah. it depends on the culture, the expression of the religion may be different because of that. Mm, yes. That's probably what it is. Yeah. So. Say I don't see any any or even any kind of interference in the work we do in the UK uh, National Health Service because of the religion. Although you have a place for prayers and everything in every hospital and a church as well. There's no temple, but you have a mosque or a, a silent mm -hmm. place for prayers. So, so by at work. Nobody even asked, nobody wants to know, or nobody even knows what their religions are. So we just carry on here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a different setup. So uh, we have good experiences. I mean, I'll, I'll conclude here and I'll stop here. I was working in Martale Hospital uh, as a senior, uh, a senior registrar, and then I was actually covering from Peradania. And uh, that's 30 miles away, yeah? And uh, I got a call once saying, uh, one of my junior Anderson is telling me, I have anesthetized this mother for this thing. She's bleeding too much. And then we can't uh, uh, save her. She's going to die. I said, no, get some fresh blood, give it to you. And then I'll be there in 30 minutes. So it took about 30 minutes for me to drive there. So when I went there, things have happened. That was fantastic. So the obstetric surgeon who was operating on the lady uh, wanted to get fresh blood and then uh, compatible, and he himself became compatible. So the obstetrician got the surgical consultant to come and cover him at the patient point of view in the operating theater and then went to give blood, and the obstetrician collapsed in the blood bank giving blood. So he couldn't come back to theater and the surgeon now had to continue. And the two years of fresh blood was given to the mother and the mother stopped bleeding and started recovering slowly. 
So then the, we had no uh, way when I got there. Now the things are a little bit better. And then we were not going to give up on this mother. And then the, there was no place to ventilate because there was no, no ICU at that time. So we decided we will ventilate this patient for two days, the operating theater itself. Got the staffing arranged and did that. And glad to say the mother woke up without any damage, went home with the little one about a week later. So then a, a paper article appeared in, in, in the region saying how good it was because I was a Slingalese. Uh, the surgeon who came was a Muslim. Then the patient was a Tamil, uh, and uh, but uh, so there was uh, all these people who helped were from different religions and different races, trying to achieve this one objective of saving this mother, and that sparked off you know how we work together without thinking of any of those things when there was an issue. So I was so impressed with the surgeon deciding to give blood to the patient, and then. Then the, um, he himself collapsing in the blood bank. So, so here we are. So we have good people who can do a lot of good jobs. Yes, Dharma has raised the hand. Dharma, yeah. Thank you, Chula. A very quick uh, experience I had in my workplace. <clears throat> I work in Sheffield. I had a very active research group, about seven PhD students. I had Buddhist, Christians, and Muslims. Uh, there were three or four Muslim students from Nigeria. And every Friday, I want to have a two hour or three hour meeting to discuss all the research results from everybody. The students are frightened to, uh, to, to come to the meeting because they say it's prayer time. Three o'clock to five o'clock, 5.30, they are frightened. I, in a very friendly way, I said, look, why can't you pray before the meeting or after the meeting? God Allah will understand you because he's a God. But these people are frightened by their seniors, by their parents or uh, from the uh, mosque they did. I mean, these are young lecturers. That is what we need to stop. I think, I think definitely by listening to them, they don't, they miss the meeting. Very important meeting. They go for praying. So I always had to change the, change the time to get everybody in. So that is something we need to, we need to stop. You know, the seniors train them to pray at that particular time. I, I said to them in a very friendly way, go, go, Allah will understand you. If you do it before and after the meeting, before or after the meeting. But still, they will not uh, come to the meeting. So they want to go for prayer. So I had to change the time all the time. So that is something we need to look at. Thank you, Chula. Yeah, I think it's very good to say, you know, different exposure and experiences because the, all that helps us to understand each other and then bring in kind of professional practice when you come to do whatever including governance, and then uh, keep the religion away because that's the faith. And it doesn't really interfere with the way you work at all. So, But these rules are there in certain places. That's one of the problems we have. Mm. Yeah, so it's good, Rosaraya, if I, I'll, I'll write to you this title and see how, how we can learn from that and give a little bit of background as to whether your group can do a talk in one day for us, yeah? Okay, definitely, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. that, uh, Tarmi, for that point you raised. We have uh, we have that perennial issue, you know. Yeah. They they yeah. have the, they have little regard for norms and other work ethics because of this call to pray to God. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that uh, impacts a lot of work. Uh, yes. I I was very friendly. I mean, we were a friendly group, and we could discuss anything. I said, look. God Allah is very understandable. Pray before you come or after you after your meeting. He will understand. But they will never do it. Because yeah. I think it's a very strict training. They were young lecturers, you see. Wow. Can you see? They were they were doing their PhDs. They were lecturers from universities, but they're trained in a very strict way. 
Yes. So that's good. That's that is good. So you are inculcating professionalism into them, which is very good in a very simple way, which is fantastic. That's what we should learn to do slowly uh, de disengage from this kind of uh, activity. Yeah. Mm. Okay. See, the intersectionality of these issues are very big for, for, for us to even understand. Yeah. Then there comes the question of accommodations. You know, accommodate. Are we is are you or is your university accommodative of religious diversity? Uh, mm. The providing for religious uh, practices. So this goes from spills from one to the other, and the problem doesn't get solved. Uh, so yeah, then it, we it, come it, back it, to having started. It 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 goes different. Say, for example, I was doing medical student teaching, and then to the first year. When the, uh, one English lecture, they were coming a bit late and so on. The first thing was I was showing a little bit of anger saying, your patient is going to wait until you have your cup of coffee or you have a break and come, the patient will be dead. And if he's not breathing, you better attend now, not half an hour later after having your break. So you bring in that caveat of being more professional from the very younger age, like now how Professor Ramdas has done to his lecturers. So you can bring it in different ways. So you become more professional as the time goes by. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so yes, yeah, we can we can do it from bottom end rather than the top end. So it's a good discussion today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank so, you. Sir, all. Anything else? You. There's no other comments. We'll stop here, and we'll listen okay. to Christianity next Sunday. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.